this is the second worst day here at IU North. Yesterday, a Dr. Bannock, B-A-N-N-E-C, wanted to send me home. You're not even short of breath. I said, yes, I am. I was in so much pain from my neck. My neck hurt so bad. I was crushed. He made me feel like I was a drug addict. The CT went down a little bit into my lungs and you could see new pulmonary infiltrates, new uh, lymphadenopathy all throughout my neck. And all of a sudden, yes, we'll treat your pain. You have to show proof that you have something wrong with you. I put forward and I maintain. If I was white, I wouldn't have to go through that. This is how black people get killed. When you send them home and they don't know how to fight for themselves. I had to talk to somebody, maybe the media, somebody, to let people know how I'm being treated up in this place. Today we're going to be having a very important yet difficult conversation about racism within healthcare, social disparities within the healthcare system, and to see what actionable things we can do to fight back. I'd like to send our condolences to Dr. Moore's family and a commitment that I'm going to make a donation on their GoFundMe page. I'm linking that down below as well if you'd like to contribute to. In order to have this in-depth discussion, I've invited special guest Dr. Kadaja Ray, a pediatric anesthesiologist and founder of the group Physician Women Soar. Let's get right into it. The difficult part of having this conversation after the fact is that because of patient privacy rules, the institution cannot really adequately say what was happening, what the results were. We can only go by the information that was released by Dr. Moore herself. My question to you is, based on her videos and her uh, writings on Facebook, how did the topic of racism enter the conversation and how should we be thinking about it when we're uh, considering her own situation? Yeah, I think um, after a certain amount of time of this treatment and this denial of how serious her symptoms were as she perceived them and as we perceive them, being told, well, you're, you're really not short of breath. I mean, anybody watching that video, you don't have to have a medical degree to appreciate that she could barely finish her sentences. One thing that we try to explain to people in the work that I do is that we know what racism looks like, just like a woman knows what sexism looks like. Um, there are things and the way people interact, certain things that are said, microaggressions, macroaggressions, um, where you know what it looks like and that's what she felt was happening and she put that name to it. Um, she felt that it, it became or it was racially driven um, and maybe the doctor didn't even realize that was driving him and we can talk about that more later. But um, there was, you know, after a point of being mistreated and mishandled, she felt that it was racism. And I've seen uh, your response but with the Physician Women's Sore group to the response that the organization gave as to what they thought was a breakdown in communication. And one of the main things you pointed out was that they did not even address the word racism in their response. Um, ideally, how would you have had uh, that conversation, say you were in that position of authority um, overseeing this incident, how would you have used the word racism? What would have been the ideal approach there? 
Well, I mean, I understand that when you're in the shoes of a big organization, I'm sure they had their PR people and their lawyers and everybody else um, kind of help craft that statement. Um, but if I was in a position where I'm making a statement and I want to have an honest conversation, you have to be transparent and you have to not take away what a person is saying. You have to listen to what the person is saying. We can't, as institutions, make pledges to do better, to do better regarding um, social justice, racial justice, and then not listen when you're being told that you missed the mark. And I would just say exactly that. Dr. Susan Moore did not receive the care that she felt she should have received. She said that it was due to racism and we are going to do everything we can to investigate this particular situation and to educate our team and our staff so that we can do better by the community that we serve. We all have implicit biases. And unfortunately, sometimes those implicit biases cause issues in the work that we have been um, charged with doing. To me, I see huge inequalities that happen uh, with communities of color. Access to medications, whether it's financial or physical, distance-wise. Uh, when I recommend a healthy diet to a patient, do they actually have the ability to acquire that diet? Do they live in a food desert? Uh, like the fact that zip codes are oftentimes more predictive of someone's health than their actual lab values. All of these things are partial factors that doctors who think holistically should be thinking about their patients. How do we distinguish systemic inequalities that a lot of times were created because of racism in our past? How do we distinguish between issues like that and situations like Dr. Moore's where racism seems to be a direct sort of uh, claim against the people delivering the care. How do we balance those two? I think it's really, it's, it's hard to balance the two, um, but we just have to be honest with ourselves. There's a Harvard um, implicit bias test that I think every everybody should take. Most people are just shocked at really what it tells them about themselves. Um, and I think that once we start having a hard look at ourselves, doing active work, to undo some of these things, then everything kind of will work together, the systemic issues versus the individual issues. Um, but we need to start with ourselves individually. Um, and then the institutions need to make real commitments, not just writing a pledge when something's popular in the media. Who are you hiring to do this work? Who is monitoring this information? And where do you start? I would almost maintain that once you start having these conversations with uh, uh, doctors who are already working, who have been in the field for 20 years, 25 years, who are at the hospital, it's a, little, it's a little late. I mean, I guess it's never too late, but we need to start much earlier in medical school, having these conversations, these classes, and really unpacking this information. In a court of law, you're judging an action, whether or not someone stole a car or didn't steal a car. When you're talking about it, racism, you're talking about partially intent. And that requires a lot of difficulty because unless they outwardly say something or write something, it's almost impossible to prove. So while that is the case, I think people take advantage of that fact that they say, oh, you can't prove I was being racist. Well, if someone with lived experience who understands the microaggressions, the tropes as well as you do, we should trust that person to be able to make that distinction. And even if it doesn't mean that it's a, um, a judicial ruling, it could mean as something as trusting an individual to make the right call, right? Correct. Correct. There yeah. has to be some kind of accountability. Um, we, we address that in the Medium article where the um, hospital systems across Indiana made a pledge to better serve the communities and to start addressing um, racial justice within medicine. People have to start holding each other accountable. One institution to the other and you know help each other out um, we need to have these conversations and really get to the bottom of what drives us and drives our decision making um, and acknowledge that there's a lot of data and literature there open up the new england journal of medicine and find so many studies documented of 
pain control um, not being the same amongst black. Black infants having the highest mortality in the NICU. Black women not surviving breast cancer at the same rate as white women. That's not because of their genetic makeup. It's because of later diagnosis, not having the same treatment options offered. And by the time these things are caught, it's too late. The same with black men and prostate cancer. The data is there. It's not being made up. So if that's there and we know it, then we have to start asking the question of the why. How is this happening? Why are people of color not receiving the same types of physical exams as their counterparts? Um, why, why is that happening? And then try to do something about it instead of then when we get the result that goes into this data and literature saying, well, but how do we know? I mean, it's, it's there. It's right there. Yeah. And we just have to acknowledge it in order to do something about it. Yeah, these disparities existing should not necessarily lead us to say, well, the whole system is racist. At least I don't think it should be labeled this way. You can disagree with me or agree with me. I'm curious, actually. But perhaps to say these disparities exist, we need to figure out why. And if it's because of past racist medical research, past racist-based systemic inequalities of housing, of redlining, that inherently makes the systemic inequality happen as a result of racism, not necessarily the fact that the individuals involved in that current system are racist themselves. You have the systemic and the institutionalized racism where you have people who don't have um, a quality of living, you know, they don't have the food available, um, they're living in places where chem there's chemical racism as far as the environment, there's a lot of um, people doing some great work in that field. Um, and then you have the doctor who may be from some small town who's never seen a black person. And now they're not doing that physical exam the way they should. And they miss that this woman has breast cancer. I love that with this channel uh, that we can perhaps put some pressure on some of these institutions. How would you go about encouraging them is a, is a nice word of making a change for both black patients, black communities, minority communities, but also their physicians and other healthcare workers. We have to put value on lives. We can't say that this one life that's in this suburb is more valuable than the life that's here in this inner city. And without resources, then you're not gonna have good doctors who are gonna wanna go work there because like you said, they're gonna get burned out, they're not gonna last, they're gonna leave. But until these institutions um, make a real commitment and say, these communities are just as valuable as the next and we have to find ways to put the money in so that we have the resources so that our doctors and our our staff are supported so they can do the jobs that they need to do. It's a really, it's a really tough hill to climb. Um, and then once you get past that, then what are we going to do internally to assure that we have the skills, and I don't mean just the medical skills, but all the skills that we need to be able to communicate, educate, interact and serve the community in which we're choosing to be in, in whatever institution that is. You've mentioned also some great practical points for providers as far as knowing your obligation, being introspective, going past the science and thinking about lived experiences and communication factors. Anything, if, if anything, do you think that you would say to patients, uh, perhaps minority patients, who um, feel like that they would like to do something to improve the quality of their care. Is there anything you counsel your patients on? Well, you know, it's interesting because this question has come up a lot. I, um, I did a radio show for um, a show in Minnesota where people were asking like, wait a minute, if this doctor couldn't advocate for herself, then how are we supposed to when we don't speak the language, we don't have the knowledge or the resources, but what I can, what I try to tell people is to do your best to advocate for yourself. If a doctor is speaking to you and you don't understand what they're saying, 
you know, what tests they're ordering, why they're telling you need to take a medication, ask them to explain it again until you understand. If you feel like you are being mistreated, then if it's an option to seek another opinion or to switch doctors, then do so. If you feel like you're not getting the care and the treatment that you deserve, then know that you can get a patient advocate within the hospital to come and be by your side to try to help you navigate the system. Um, and then I would tell people, if you feel like you're not getting what you need, then maybe try to find a doctor that you can better relate to. If you are um, a man and you feel more comfortable with a male physician, then maybe seek that out so that you're able to better communicate and openly discuss your medical concerns um, so that you can get the care that you deserve. And this isn't an obligation for patients. It's our obligation to make sure that the patient understands. When you're listening to a patient's reaction to your instructions is the same when a doctor is performing a speculum exam should be making eye contact with the patient as well to make sure they're comfortable. So it's the doctor's obligation and the institution's obligation to make sure the patient's getting good care. The reason we're giving these extra bits or you're giving these tidbits to patients is to go the extra mile. And it's not their responsibility to do this. We have to constantly remind providers that because they say, well, then why didn't the patient advocate for themselves? Well, while they can, and that oftentimes fails as seen in Dr. Moore's case, it's just something that I would tell my family member uh, almost to expect the medical system at times to fail and if they're able to advocate and educate themselves, they will statistically have better outcomes. And perhaps that will not solve all our problems, but it can at least give some um, practical advice for those who are interested in seeking it. How do we go about talking of, about racism historically and present without further deteriorating the doctor-patient relationship that exists between the black community as an example and doctors. We can't put that acknowledgement potentially causing a problem back on the community that has been wronged. So For sure. the, the talking about it and the conversations, the acknowledgement is not the issue or the problem of the black community, okay? Agreed. So we have to, because we know, um, there's a wonderful book called Medical Apartheid that talks about how these while the medical establishment has not documented a lot of the abuses, these situations, these experiences have been passed down amongst our communities, even verbally, for hundreds of years. So it's well known. So what do we do? For example, when we are now faced with the COVID vaccine and how do we get communities to then say, okay, well, I'm going to go get this vaccine when um, there's this long historical relationship where we haven't been treated that well. We've been tricked many times. Um, it comes into education, having people who look like them, who they trust, providing that information and being available to answer questions which is a whole other conversation about how uh, we are underrepresented in medicine and in medical school and why. That's a whole other conversation. But there are plenty of studies that have been done that show that Black patients do better with doctors who look like them. Instead of saying that those communities don't trust the medical establishment, we have to change our speech, and which then starts to change the way we think. The medical establishment has not done what they need to do to earn the trust of those communities. Mm -hmm. So if I'm hearing you right, just to reiterate, in order for us to do better in the medical space to treat our patients, because ultimately, uh, as a whole, we want to help everybody. We, that's the goal, the oath that we take as physicians, as nurses. We need to do better in reaching out to communities, creating more diversity within our own groups so that they can communicate better and take this long road to improving our ability to communicate 
with the black community, for example. Yes, that's correct. For example, um, you know, you have primary care doctors who say, oh my goodness, it's just so frustrating. Mrs. So-and-so just won't take the blood pressure medicine or won't take their diabetic medications or, yeah, yeah. you know, they're just not complying. They just don't. You have to have a conversation, a real human conversation, and this can apply to any patient, really. Yeah. The why. Why is that? Is it access? Is it financial? Is it some kind of belief system where they're afraid to take the medication? If you really have an honest conversation with yourself as the physician, did you stop and really explain and assure that they understood the importance of whatever it is, whatever treatment, test, whatever it is that you're trying to communicate? Did you communicate in a way that they understand? Did you read the body language to see was there some kind of trepidation on the part of the patient and really get to the bottom of why. A good friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Judy Washington, um, actually works with the STFM organization to increase diversity in medicine, to have this conversation. They actually have an underrepresented minority fund to help with scholarships. Is this the sole solution or do we need to think past scholarships, past admissions, is there something we're missing here that we haven't yet tried? Oh boy, Dr. Mike, that's a whole other segment. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it does go past the scholarships. By that time, it's almost too late. Um, we have to start by figuring out what's going on in the public school system, what's going on in the inner cities, what's happening with the STEM programs in those schools and those children when they're in elementary school. Um, they don't have the resources. And I think COVID has exposed a lot of those disparities. People don't even have computers or access to Wi-Fi and the internet. So how could they possibly um, you know, get involved in and do what they need to do for some of these classes and programs? Um, you know, there are issues at the the primary school level the inner city schools, and we are missing potential doctors because they're just not being fostered. They're going to high schools that don't have a strong AP program. If you don't have AP classes or honors classes, then how are you gonna get into a competitive college? So it goes back to that institutionalized racism that nobody likes to discuss, but is certainly there, um, where there are children all over this country who don't have the same opportunities and while their minds and their capabilities are just like others, um, there's nothing there to foster it. They don't have the programming and so they don't have those opportunities to even go to a college that would be competitive enough to prepare them. I grew up in the inner city, south side of Chicago um, and there's a program that's been around for a very long time, since the 70s, called the CHAMPS, Chicago Area Health and Medical Careers Program. And it was uh, housed over at the IIT. Um, there was a college IIT in the south side of Chicago. And that was what their program was all about, taking young children who had some kind of propensity or interest in science and math and following them all the way through high school, all the way to medical school. And without a program like that, coming from the inner city, I don't think I would be sitting here with you today. That's such a sad point to hear, but an important point to hear that young folks are trapped in this vicious cycle that either they're not exposed to good education early on, or even if they have interest early on, their communities are not set up to foster that sort of enthusiasm, or they get pulled into crime-ridden communities and as a result, they lose focus on their education. It's not a knock at all on STFM and the scholarships and the amazing work that they're doing. It's just showing that while that is part of what we need to do, there's this whole other under-addressed section of the beginning of how we get students to get these scholarships. And the reality of the fact, when we look at a lot of the assistance programs that we have, even in my hospital where I work, a lot of them go unclaimed. And it's partially because our lack of communication, it's because failed communication, 
and because we're not addressing that initial stage that you talked about of starting people up to know that these programs exist, to get them excited about becoming uh, a pediatric anesthesiologist like yourself. And that initial start is such an important place to talk about and focus on that I really hope as we move forward in the era of investing into healthcare, into children, we really think about that educational aspect. And I hope that's where a lot of change happens. I'm one of those perhaps naive believers that if with education, you could change almost everything. Um, if you have an educated patient in that it won't solve every problem, it'll improve their outcomes. If you have education to young folks, they'll be excited to be providers and then be providers for the people who perhaps uh, look more like them and have better outcomes. So I really would like to see more incentivization early on, as opposed to going to high school solely and saying, well, if you go, we can give you this scholarship. That early on aspect is something I'm really passionate about as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's great. Those scholarships and the scholarships, like the one that your friend is doing is important. And again, all things like that is what allowed me to get through the system and many of my friends. So it's all very important. We just have to continue to look at every level um, because we're missing out on a lot of people who could uh, do very well, um, but they're just not given the opportunity and they don't have the access. I know we covered a lot. I'd love to leave you with the last word. What do you think should be the ultimate message to the million plus people, hopefully, that will watch this video? I think that um, I would just like to impart on people that the discussion about race is a very difficult discussion, but it's one that's necessary. Um, people are dying and people are dying needlessly so because of just because of the color of their skin. And that's unacceptable. We have to reach out to our neighbors and try to understand each other, have conversations, get to know each other, and don't deny other people's experiences. My condolences go out to Dr. Susan Moore's family. Um, we lost a big part of our medical community, and I think that we should all walk away from that just remembering that when somebody, when a, a black person or a person of color or whatever the situation is, when somebody speaks and they're saying something, we have to listen. Um, she knows what, she knew what racism was. She called it and it may have possibly um, cost her her life. Um, I say that Dr. Moore passed away due to two things, two pandemics the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, and the racism pandemic. We have to have these conversations so that we can take that off of the table. Um, people need to be treated fairly. We know what our ex experiences are. And just because you have not experienced it, you have to op uh, approach these conversations with an open heart and ear and have some empathy so that we can get some real change. Thank you so much, Dr. Ray. Uh, I'm linking all of your information down below where people can find you, your uh, physician SOAR group, and to continue their education, much like I need to do in reading Medical Apartheid, uh, other resources to continue learning because we're all imperfect. We all have implicit biases. And I thank everybody for watching and Dr. Ray for her wise words and advice.